How does it work like this? <clears throat> well, first, thank you all for being here to attend to my presentation here. And I also would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here at uh, Exact Energy. My name is uh, Felix Rose, and I work in Paris with uh, Nicolas Dupy, who speak here this morning to, about quantum phase transitions. So the topic of this talk is the following. I'm going to speak about the conductivity in the vicinity of a quantum critical point. So as Nicolas told you this morning, um, several quantum systems undergo a quantum phase transition at zero temperature when uh, an external parameter is tuned. And he will be interested in continuous quantum phase transitions where systems be, uh, exhibit universal properties. And in particular, we'll be dealing with the con universal property the, of the conductivity in the quantum oven model in two plus one dimensions. So the outline of this talk is the following. In the first part, I'll recall to everybody what is the quantum one model and how is the conductivity defined and general results about the conductivity. Then, as this is the ERG conference, I'll speak about an exact ERG of functional non-perturbative, as you wish, scheme to compute the conductivity. And in the last part, I'll present some results about this. So, as an introduction, the Oven model has this action. Um, the action is defined with phi, which is a n-component scalar field. And since this is a quantum model, the temperature dependence is contained in a space, uh, in a time dimension, excuse me, which has a, a finite length beta, the inverse temperature. And the system is defined in d dimensions, d space dimensions. So here we'll be looking into the two dimensional problem with two space dimensions, because at zero temperature, the quantum phase transition is controlled by the three dimensional Wilson Fisher fixed point which is interesting. This model has also experimental relevance for small m. For n equals 2, it corresponds to cold atoms, actually cold bosons in lattices. And for n equals 3, it corresponds to spin systems. So how is the conductivity defined for this model? Well, I recall to everybody that the one symmetry is a continuous symmetry. So we can make this global continuous symmetry local by adding a gauge field. That is, we change the derivative in the action into a covariant derivative, which is the derivative minus a mu, which is the gauge field. A mu belongs to the Lie algebra of ON, which is SON, which is the algebra of skew symmetric matrices. So we can decompose uh, the gauge field this way over the generators of the skew symmetric matrices. Since we have n times n minus 1 over 2 generators of the skew symmetric of the of an, uh, group, we, are, we have that many current densities, which has these definitions. So maybe this uh, definition is a little, uh, how can I say, arid for those not used to dealing, in dealing with it. But for the case of small n, when you have bosons and actually the O2 symmetry is the U1 symmetry, you recall the standard expression in quantum mechanics for the current of, uh, in quantum mechanics. And uh, the conserved charge is obviously the uh, electrical charge. So linear response theory predicts this form for the, the conductivity. It is related to this kernel K, which is mostly the correlation function of two currents. But it is also the second derivative of free energy with respect to gauge fields. So um, it would have been possible for me not to use gauge fields in this formulation, since we simply need to compute this. And we could do so with external sources coupling to the, coupling to the current. But he will be interested in preserving the gauge symmetry, uh, in preserving the gauge symmetry, simply because it provides us with useful identities because uh, it constrains the problem furthermore. So what can be said about the conductivity? Well, the conductivity tensor is diagonal in position space. This stems from the isotropy of the theory, but also in the uh, space of the generators of the rotations. And the conductivity only depends on the, uh, the rotation you consider. It has at most two independent components, which can be um, heuristically found this way. If you consider a rotation of the ON space, it can either rotate the other parameter or not rotate it. So rotations that do 
actually rotate the other parameter will be set to belong to I class, whereas rotations that do not will be set to belong to B class. I should note that in the disordered phase of the quantum Kuchika point, since the value of the other parameter is zero, all rotations are equivalent with respect to the other parameter, and we have only one independent conductivity. So for n equals two, which is an interesting case as it describes bosons, you have only one generator, which always rotates the other parameter, so the conductivity sigma b is not defined. So generic things can be said about the low frequency behavior of the system. In the symmetric phase, the system is insulating and the conductivity behaves like a capacitance, whereas in the symmetric phase, the symmetry, the broken symmetry phase, excuse me, the conductivity sigma a assumes these forms. Actually, it behaves like an inductance, which would be the case for a perfect uh, metal. Also, at the critical point, this conductivity takes a universal value, sigma star, which is a constant with respect to omega. Uh, sigma, the behavior of sigma b has been uh, a lot less studied, mostly because um, it, uh, it does not exist for bosons, but we'll also discuss it later. So you see that already in the low frequency behavior, you have um, some interesting universal physics to study. The first one is this universal conductivity sigma star, but also the ratio of C over L, the capacitance over the inductance at two symmetric points with respect to quantum phase transition, is a universal quantity. So the, what we want to study is the universal scaling form of the conductivity in the whole momentum range, but we have also interesting things to study at low frequencies. So several approaches have been devised in the past to study this, both quantum Monte Carlo and the ADS CFT, as uh, Nicolas spoke about in the, this morning. We'll also present right now exact energy. So all these approaches have advantages and drawbacks and uh, are complementary. So before devising an exact energy scheme, we will need um, uh, an effective action formulation of a theory which is um, the following. So you are all familiar with the effective action formulation of uh, statistical mechanics. The only subtlety here is the presence of the gauge field, which is the source field uh, which is needed to derive the conductivity, which is present in the partition function and will be present in the effective action after we perform the Legendre transform. So you can define these generalized vertices, which are derivatives of the gauge of the, excuse me, the effective action with respect to either the five field or the gauge field, and the, the kernel K, which is related to the conductivity, uh, is related to these vertices, gamma not two, gamma one one, and gamma two not, which is the inverse propagator, actually. So what we need to do with non perturbative energy is to devise a scheme uh, to compute these uh, low vertices momenta. So, I'm not dwelling too much on this because um, everybody this afternoon has been uh, talking about this scheme. Uh, we'll add an infrared regulator which uh, will interpolate between mean field and the exact theory. But this uh, regulator, as usual for the ON model with uh, NPRG, uh, is akin to a mass term which depends on uh, both Q and K. And, uh, I, I, but uh, the problem here is that I said I wished to compute uh, to, excuse me, to preserve gauged variance of the theory. So how do we do so? Well, it's as simple as this. We make the regulator gauge dependent. So this idea um, has already been present in the past in the QCD community, but um, it's uh, less useful for QCD than for us because uh, here we are in the simple case where the gauge field is an external source. It's not dynamical, and we simply take derivatives with respect to the gauge field before setting it to zero. You see that this regulator term in, X, in position space has this form and uh, with this function L uh, taken as a function of the gradient. Well, we simply promote this gradient to a covariant derivative to make this term delta SK explicitly dependent on the gauge field and explicitly gauge invariant. Uh, because of this, when you take functional derivatives of the flow equation with respect to the gauge, uh, the gauge field, you have additional terms which actually preserve gauge invariance and help you recover uh, ward identities and uh, basically your symmetries. So that's the RG scheme, and we now need an approximation to actually compute the flow of the vertices gamma of k. 
So for the approximation, our first thought was to use the Blaiseau, Mendes, Galin, Schieber approximation, because what we wanted was, what we want, excuse me, is the full momentum dependence of vertices. So we've already used uh, this scheme to obtain, the, to study the, the Higgs amplitude mode in the vicinity of the quantum phase transition, and we thought we'd be able to um, extend it easily to uh, the problem of conductivity. But the issue here is that this fails. Basically, it is, um, since in the current uh, you have a gradient, when you take Fourier transforms, um, you have a, a momenta. And uh, the vertices, uh, with, with derivative with respect to the gauge field, has a non-trivial momenta dependence. So either you set the momenta to zero and you obtain, uh, like is done in the BMWX <laughs> approximation, as evidenced by Leonie uh, right before me, uh, if you set the momenta to zero, uh, you, obtain, um, you obtain trivial equations. So we tried to be a little smarter than this, and we tried to work around it, but our solutions actually broke down the gauge invariance, even with the derivative. So it was not a solution. So we had to fall back on some uh, less precise scheme, the derivative expansion scheme, which will allow us to uh, obtain the low, momenta uh, the low momenta range of the, uh, of the model. So what is the derivative expansion? Well, we project the flow equation onto a gauge invariant and that's. And what is important here is that we are able to explicitly devise a gauge invariant scheme. So we are using a standard derivative expansion at the order two uh, in the fields uh, with these three functions, the potential U and these two randomizations of the, um, uh, excuse me, of the self energy. And uh, we can construct two additional terms uh, that with the gauge field that respect the gauge invariance. So basically we use this F mu nu, which is the sort of generalization here of the electromagnetic tensor. So within this ansatz, the conductivity has an exact, well, has an expression, which is certainly not exact, uh, which is the expression of the conductivity within the derivative expansion. Well, we can integrate the flows to obtain the, these values Values, and that's what we did. So the results uh, go as follows. We recover most of the low momenta, um, low momenta physics. So earlier I said that the, ra uh, the ratio of the capacitance over the inductance at two symmetric points with respect to the phase transition is a universal ratio. Well, we're about to compute it for all values of n, and at large n, we recover the exact value that you, that you can compute uh, well, the exact value. And that small, for small values of n, we have a good agreement with Monte Carlo. So this is quite convincing. However, for the, U, the critical conductivity, sigma star, um, we have something more complicated. Uh, and this stems from the fact that um, the derivative expansion is only valid at small frequencies. So sometimes uh, you are able to extrapolate, but this is not the case here. Actually, one of the vertices involved in the flow uh, diverges like 1 over p. So the derivative expansion is a small p expansion of the uh, effective action, and uh, it fails here. Actually, you see that the, the conductivity takes this form for small k with a fixed point value times a function of uh, omega over k, the ratio of the frequency over the, the running scale k with this fixed point value for uh, x1 tilde critical. So something that can be done here is to say that we cut the flow by the frequency omega to have an estimate of the conductivity. It is of the order of x1 critical. So this is in no way an exact computation. x1 critical is not the universal value of uh, sigma star. But it gives us an idea, and it is also consistent. It is a proof that we can see sort of, in the derivative expansion scheme, that um, the conductivity reaches a plateau value. So this, that's it for the universal conductivity, but something more interesting uh, even happens in the ordered phase for the conductivity sigma b. Actually, the same thing happens. Uh, the quantity x1, which yields the conductivity sigma b, reaches it, a fixed point value in the um, ordered phase. So from this, we can infer that um, sigma b, the, the, the conductivity sigma b, is a universal quantity in the whole ordered phase. This is also 
this also can be verified by computation for n equals infinity. But here it is a conjecture because it is based with this uh, idea of uh, using the, the fixed point value of x1 and cutting the flow by the frequency omega. But something even more interesting happens uh, is that the fixed point value uh, in the ordered phase does not seem to depend on the value of n. So here I represent with the, when integrating the flow, this, uh, the value of x1 tilde, the dimensionless quantity. In the full line represents what happens at the quantum critical point. Uh, so you see the fixed point values. And the dashed lines at different points uh, in the ordered phase. And you see that for all values of n, uh, all curves go to the same fixed point. So numerically, we see that x1 tilde in the ordered phase, the, the, the value of the fixed point does not seem to depend on n. So we make this following conjecture. The, the conductivity sigma v is universal for all n's, and this is what we sort of call the super universality with quotes. So to sum things up, we here devised a gauge invariant exact energy scheme to compute the conductivity, and with us, um, an ansatz as simple, an approximation as simple as the diversity expansion, we recover most of the low momenta physics. These results also allow us to make a conjecture on the universal behavior and the, the conductivity sigma b in the other phase, but this is only a conjecture, and to confirm it, we actually need to develop a momentum dependent scheme. Well, actually, we are on the way into it. The long-term goal for this study would be to see what happens at finite temperature because actually none of the methods we listed uh, before have been able yet to, to, to tell us what happens at finite temperature. So it's an, as of yet an unsolved question. If you're more interested into this, um, I think that uh, in the next few weeks we'll publish a preprint on the item. So that's it for my talk. Are there any questions?